You asked for more weird weapons that totally failed, so we found more. Welcome to part 2 of the most bizarre, asinine, impractical weapons that never made it to the battlefield or were such a disaster that they were more of a liability than a help in a fight. We dug deep into the historical archives to uncover the worst of the worst and the weirdest of the weird. Sit back, relax, and prepare to be awestruck by just how terribly strange some of these weapons were. Tanks are the movable fortresses of the battlefield, but sometimes a tank is made so terribly that it becomes impractical. Perhaps no tank better embodies this description than Tsar Tank. The Tsar Tank is by far one of the weirdest tanks ever constructed. Not only that, but it's probably the most ineffective tank the world of warfare has ever seen. The Tsar Tank was built by Russian engineers in 1914 and was a big tricycle. The front two wheels were each around 27 feet tall and powered by their own engines. After the prototype was built and tested, a few problems became glaringly clear. The first was that the entire contraption could barely get moving. Although the tanks don't necessarily move very fast, the Tsar tank actually had two engines that could each produce 500 horsepower. This was more power than most wartime vehicles had at the time, and the tank itself was relatively light, meaning it should have hypothetically been able to move at a good speed. However, there was a major problem with its design. During the design phase, the engineers miscalculated and the weight distribution came out all wrong. The tank was too heavy in the back, which put too much weight on the back wheel. This resulted in that wheel getting stuck in the ground, keeping the whole vehicle from moving. For whatever reason, the Russians didn't want to use tracks like the other countries were experimenting with at the time. Instead, they believed the giant wheels and the tricycle setup was the best way to go. You can probably guess that this wasn't actually the best option, as we don't have three-wheeled tanks cruising around the world today. Another problem with this configuration was that the angle and direction the Tsar tank's cannon could fire was very limited due to the large front wheels blocking the turret. But the biggest failure of the Tsar tank was that it was an easy target for artillery fire. The wheels could be damaged by explosions, meaning that all it would take is a single shell or a well-placed grenade to render the Tsar tank completely useless. Once the tank became incapacitated, the crew inside would be sitting ducks. All the enemy had to do was wait for the Russian soldiers to come out and pick them off one by one as they tried to climb down to the ground level. All in all, the Tsar tank not only looked silly but was a complete waste of time and resources. Nuclear weapons are incredibly scary on their own. The most concerning thing about these next few weapons is that they increase the risk of nuclear accidents occurring. The Davy Crockett weapon system might be the most powerful and craziest gun ever invented. It was a smoothbore recoilless rifle that was designed to fire a tactical nuke just over a mile. Like many weapons of mass destruction, it was built during the Cold War in the 1950s. Launching a nuke from a rifle might seem like a weird concept to us today, especially when you think about the radiation and how being a mile away from a nuclear explosion is not nearly far enough. With the right wind conditions, the radioactive fallout would be upon you in minutes. Yet, during the Cold War, the ability for a few soldiers to fire a nuke across the battlefield at an advancing enemy army seemed like a good idea. Luckily, the Davy Crockett weapon system never had to be used. Even if things did get that far, Davy Crockett had all sorts of problems. The rifle was incredibly inaccurate, meaning that the nuke wouldn't necessarily land exactly where the soldier was aiming. Since it fired a nuclear warhead, being inaccurate wasn't a huge deal, as the explosion would be massive and obliterate the intended target even if it detonated several hundred feet away. The weapon's inaccuracy, along with the likelihood of the firing team and friendly forces in the area getting an unhealthy dose of radiation, was enough to retire the Davy Crockett weapon system. However, that wasn't before at least 2,000 were made. Imagine 2,000 nukes being fired at the enemy from rifles. That is a terrifying thought. However, there was another more ominous reason that the Davy Crockett never made it to the battlefield. There was very little accountability for a squad in control of a Davy Crockett. Infantry soldiers would have the ability to launch nukes without necessarily going through the proper channels or the chain of command. All it would have taken was one rogue unit carrying a Davy Crockett to launch a nuke at a Soviet force to kickstart World War III and the annihilation of the human race. This was a scary thought, and one that many in NATO brought up, which led to the decommissioning of the Davy Crockett weapon system in 1971 before it could ever be used. If you thought the Davy Crockett was a terrifying device with several shortcomings, you won't believe the destructive potential of this next crazy weapon called the Blue Peacock. The Blue Peacock was a name given to a nuclear mine developed by the British in the 1950s. The other names given to this device were Blue Bunny and Brown Bunny. Regardless of the weird choice of color and cute animals for the name of this terrifying weapon, we can all be thankful that it was a big failure. The Blue Peacock weighed around 7.2 tons. It was the size of a car 
and held enough plutonium to generate a 10 kiloton nuclear explosion. The Brits planned to bury this device along strategic points into West Germany. That way, if Soviet tanks ever tried to invade Europe, they would be blown to smithereens. The problem was that if the Blue Peacock was triggered, it would not only destroy the Soviet forces, but it would annihilate any civilian structures or friendly forces in the surrounding area. There are multiple reasons why these nuclear mines were failures, and each one is crazier than the last. The Blue Peacock didn't even work like a normal mine. The idea was that the Brits would quickly dig a hole, drop the seven-ton mine in, and then retreat to safety. Then, when Soviet forces were directly over the mine, they would use a remote detonating system to activate the bomb. The problem was that the triggering device was temperamental and didn't always go off. The backup plan for the Blue Peacock was that in case remote activation wasn't an option, the mine would be set on an eight-day timer. After the allotted time, the mine would explode no matter what. It would have been a real bummer if the mine was activated and NATO forces managed to push the Soviets back after only seven days because 24 hours later the Blue Peacock would detonate, vaporizing everything in the area. That is, unless the British scientists could uncover the mine, get inside it, and disarm the nuclear warhead. It's not clear if there was ever a safe way to disarm the timing system on a Blue Peacock. The designers hadn't really worked out all the kinks by the time the Blue Peacock was being considered for deployment. So there was a solid chance that even if the Soviets had been pushed back successfully, the bomb would go off anyway. Another problem was the device needed to be kept warm while it was set up underground during winter, and this had to be done using an independent energy system. The solution the British engineers came up with was so absurd, we had to double check it to make sure we weren't hallucinating. The plan to keep the device at the right temperature was to put several chickens inside the mine with enough food to keep them fed until the British wanted the bomb to detonate. For example, if the British needed the bomb to explode after eight days, they would give the chickens inside the casing just enough to last them eight days, at which point they would starve to death. Once the chickens were dead, the temperature of the bomb would drop and it would explode. Let that sink in for a moment. The solution to keep the wires and circuits warm enough in the nuclear landmine so it wouldn't go off was to use birds that peck at everything around them. We can't believe we have to say this, but this turned out to be an incredibly bad idea. The weapon specialist who came up with it proposed wrapping key components with chicken wire to keep the birds from pecking at them, but you can only imagine how effective that would have been. It would only be a matter of time before one of the chickens pecked at something it shouldn't have, thus detonating the nuke prematurely, killing all the chickens inside, oh, and anyone else in the surrounding area. Chickens were not the only animal considered for weird military operations. In fact, animals have been used in some very, very strange ways by many countries around the world. The CIA classified one project Acoustic Kitty. This was not just a clever name for a secret weapon, it was almost a literal description of what the espionage device would be. The plan was to stick a microphone into a cat's ear that was connected to a radio transmitter implanted in their skull. The cat would then be released inside of a building the CIA wanted ears in so they could listen to everything that was going on. However, they ran into a few problems. For anyone who owns a cat, you probably already know what the first problem was. Cats don't follow instructions very well. They are creatures that play by their own rules, so although they could infiltrate an enemy headquarters, they'd probably spend more time chasing mice and licking themselves than collecting valuable intel. The second problem was that cats, like all living things, can be fragile. On one of the first test runs of Acoustic Kitty, a cat was deployed in a park to pick up the conversation of two men sitting on a bench. Unfortunately, the test didn't go according to plan. In uncovered documents from the program, a memo stated that the cat never made it to the man on the bench where the conversation was happening. The researcher in charge of testing the acoustic kitty in the park stated that instead of walking over to the men sitting on the bench, the cat wandered into the street where it was promptly squashed by a taxi. Like that cat, the acoustic kitty program was squashed by the government and the weaponized cats never became part of the spy program. Before the CIA started using cats as secret spies, the Soviets were using dogs as anti-tank weapons. Dogs are man's best friend, and the Soviets thought they'd make great soldiers as well. The Soviets needed to find a way to deal with enemy tanks as World War II looked more and more like an inevitability in the 1930s. Since dogs are incredibly smart and loyal, the Soviets decided they could train them to place anti-tank mines under enemy tanks rendering them useless. The plan was for the dogs to act as a deployment system for the anti-tank mines. They were trained to carry the bombs in a harness on their back, and once they were under the tank, they would release the pack and run away to safety before it detonated. The training seemed to go well, and when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union between 1941 and 1943, the Red Army had around 40,000 anti-tank dogs to fight against the Nazi tank divisions. Unfortunately, there were a few problems with the anti-tank dogs. 
At the beginning, they worked pretty well and even incapacitated several German tanks. However, once the Nazis realized what the dogs were doing, they would shoot them before they reached their targets. This was not only terribly sad, but pretty much put a stop to the Soviet plans to keep the tanks from advancing further into their homeland. The other problem with the Soviet anti-tank dog program was that the training itself wasn't thought out all the way. The Soviets needed to simulate a battle situation so they had their anti-tank dogs train on out-of-commission Soviet tanks. This made sense until the Soviet soldiers deployed their anti-tank dogs in battle and they didn't attack the Nazi tanks. The issue was that the German tanks ran on gasoline while the Soviet tanks ran on diesel. The dogs had been trained to identify their targets by smell, and so in the middle of a battle they would run to Soviet tanks and drop their bombs off there instead of attacking the German tanks. This was not the dogs' fault, they did exactly as they were trained to do. They sniffed out tank fumes and deployed their mines. It just so happened that they were carrying out their mission against Soviet diesel tanks instead of Nazi gasoline tanks. This was obviously embarrassing for the Soviets, so when they released the success rate of the anti-tank dog program, they calculated that they had destroyed about 300 tanks. However, this number is likely inflated or also accounts the damaged Soviet tanks that were targeted by accident to justify the time and money spent on training the dogs. With all the anti-tank dogs running around, it's no wonder the Nazis took to the skies. However, one aircraft in particular had a weird design and was known for being a little unstable. The Messerschmitt Me-163 Comet was the first rocket-powered fighter plane ever produced. It was designed by Nazi scientists and had its first test flight in 1941. The size and shape may seem a little weird at first, but this was a completely unique aircraft that was the Luftwaffe's answer to the high-flying American bombers that quickly became a thorn in Germany's side. The Comet could accelerate to 550 miles per hour and reach 39,000 feet in 3.45 minutes. This meant that if bombers were spotted heading toward Nazi-controlled airspace, they could launch the Me-163s to intercept and destroy the bomber before it could drop its payload. In theory, the Comet sounded great. However, in practice, it wasn't nearly as effective as the Nazis had hoped. In order to reach the high altitudes at breakneck speeds, the Comet used a mix of two highly volatile propellants that when combined gave the rocket a huge amount of thrust. This resulted in the Comet moving too fast for the Nazi pilots to engage the slow-moving bombers before they went whizzing by their target. On top of that, the Comet could only maintain its burn for around 7 minutes, so if the pilot overshot his target, it was unlikely he could pass the target again before running out of fuel. The Comet was designed to expend all of its fuel before gliding back down to Earth for a safe landing. However, controlling the descent of an aircraft without working engines is incredibly difficult, and crash landings were not uncommon. This meant that even if the Comet was successful in its mission, there was still a pretty good chance the aircraft wouldn't be able to land successfully, and the Nazis would lose both their state-of-the-art rocket and their pilot. But all these problems were the least of the pilot's concern. The volatile nature of the propellant meant that accidents caused by unstable fuel mixtures were common. If the proportions were just slightly off, the entire gas tank could ignite, and the Comet would explode on the tarmac. Therefore, every time the engines were started, there was a chance the whole plane would go up in flames. As far as failures go, the Me-163 Comet was a doozy. Around 360 of the rocket planes were built, but they only shot down 16 enemy bombers in total. Due to mishaps and accidents, at least 13 Comets were destroyed although the number is much likely higher. This means that it's very possible that more Nazi comets blew up as a result of design flaws than the number of US bombers they shot down. At first glance, a sticky bomb might seem like a strange yet effective way to destroy an enemy transport or damage a tank. However, the sticky bombs of World War II tended to have all sorts of problems that would render them useless and even deadly to the soldier throwing it. Sticky bombs were designed to be used against tanks during World War II. The idea was that by having an adhesive coating around the outside of the grenade, it would make damaging a tank much easier since the vehicle wouldn't be able to drive away from the explosive. However, these weapons did not always work as intended. The anti-tank hand grenade number 74 had an outer shell that was removed by pulling a pin. This would expose the sticky adhesive that surrounded the bomb. The soldier would then run up to a tank, activate the 5 second fuse, and gently toss or place the sticky bomb on its hull before running for cover. The main difference between a regular grenade and a sticky bomb is that it was intended to stick to an object. The fact that the adhesive was on the outside of the bomb wouldn't stick to dust or dirt was a huge problem. It meant the sticky bomb literally couldn't do its job. Obviously, a sticky bomb that doesn't stick is a failure of a weapon, however, it gets worse. The adhesive on the sticky bomb tended to leak and attach itself to the hand or clothing of the soldier trying to throw it. When he let go of the sticky bomb and found that it was now stuck to him instead of the target, there was nothing he could do but run away from his squad mates before it exploded. 
Sometimes if the bomb stuck to his soldier's clothing and he was a quick thinker he would rip off the piece of clothing and toss it away before the bomb detonated. This sometimes led to soldiers ripping off their pants that a sticky bomb had attached to and fighting the rest of the battle in their underwear, which would definitely be embarrassing but much better than being blown up by your own sticky grenade. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party designed some incredibly weird weapons. Most of them fell into the category of Wunderwaffe or wonder weapons. Most of these devices were never built, like the Sun Gun, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and long-range aircraft that could bomb the US. However, some astonishingly large weapons were designed and successfully manufactured by the Wunderwaffe program, and almost all were failures. Hitler was a big fan of big guns with gigantic turrets. Kind of makes you wonder if he was compensating for something. For example, the V3 cannon stood for Wegelturnswaffe 3, or Vengeance Weapon. This was a large caliber cannon that was 430 feet long and used the multi-charge principle to shoot its 310-pound shells. What this means is that the projectile went through a secondary propellant chamber after it had been fired to give it more speed and thus a longer range. The V3 was constructed in the Pas de Calais region of northern France, where it was supposed to be used to bombard London from mainland Europe. However, the amount of time it took the Nazis to construct the gigantic cannon allowed the Allies to carry out bombing runs across the channel to destroy key Nazi targets. Unfortunately for Hitler's large cannons, they were all destroyed in these bombing runs before they could fire a single shot across the channel and into England. It was the sheer magnitude of these cannons that made them so vulnerable and unrealistic for war raging in Europe. However, Hitler didn't want to hear excuses, he just wanted bigger guns. Enter the Schwerer Gustav. This railway cannon weighed around 1,500 tons and fired shells weighing just under 8 tons up to 30 miles. It was a massive weapon that could deliver a huge amount of damage to any target it could hit. But this was the problem. The Schwerer Gustav was not very accurate. It was incredibly slow to set up, aim, fire, and reload. In fact, it's reported that the Schwerer Gustav was only used a handful of times, if at all, because of the time it took to move the gigantic weapons from place to place. The Schwerer Gustav could only be hauled by train, and with supplies and resources dwindling toward the end of the war, Hitler and the Nazi leaders decided to retire the Schwerer Gustav before it saw much action. They poured enormous amounts of resources into the massive gun only to bring it back to a warehouse and dismantle it so it didn't fall into the hands of Allied forces. It's ironic that the Nazis had to destroy their own insane weapons just so it wouldn't be turned against them. Hitler didn't just like big guns, he liked big tanks as well. Unfortunately, the Panzerkampfwagen 8 Maus was so audacious that it literally got stuck in its tracks. This behemoth of a vehicle is the largest tank design ever built, but this tank had big problems. Its enormous size meant that it was incredibly slow and that the engines would often overheat from the stress of having to move the several tons of steel. It was also too heavy to cross most bridges without causing them to collapse, and it would destroy roads whenever it drove over them, which was a huge problem for other support vehicles behind it. Even though the Nazis succeeded in creating the biggest tank the world had ever seen, it ended up being a huge failure. The Panzerkampfwagen 8 Maus was retired before it saw much action. One of the weirdest bombs ever created is probably the bouncing bomb. As the name suggests, this device didn't detonate when it hit something, instead it bounced around for a while before eventually coming to a stop and then exploding. Sometimes this was a good thing, sometimes it was very bad. Most often bouncing bombs were used to target enemy dams. The idea was that the bombs could be dropped from airplanes and would float toward their intended target. This allowed them to avoid the torpedo nets and minefields that would have hindered the effectiveness of traditional torpedoes. The problem was that no matter how many calculations were done, it was almost impossible to predict exactly how the currents and the waves of the water would affect the trajectory of the bouncing bomb. The bomb would be dropped from a low-flying plane and would skip across the water until it reached the dam. Then it would sink below the surface and detonate underwater like a depth charge. The explosion would send shockwaves through the dam and cause it to collapse flooding everything downriver and disrupting energy and water supplies. However, if the bouncing bomb sank too far away from the dam, it would explode without causing damage to its target. Unfortunately, the explosion would still kill any fish or aquatic animals in the vicinity. The unreliability of the bouncing bombs and their unnerving ability to detonate prematurely in the planes carrying them to their objective led to only a handful being used during British RAF missions. Now watch Weird Weapons of War That Totally Failed or check out Weirdest Weapons Prisoners Made While Locked Up.